sharing on Facebook Live. All right, so I'm just going to start webinar. Start. All right, cool. I think we we're good to go. I've uh, why why I try and talk sooner is because I've seen other webinars on uh, on Facebook where it takes the guys like two minutes, and I think we were the same in the beginning where you're not sure if you're live and you're live and you squint and you. So I, as soon as I click go live, I just start talking, you know, because it, it seems a little, a little bit more professional, but now I've just given away my secret, but that's also okay. All right. So welcome everybody. Welcome to uh, another episode of the green room. Uh, it is the 16th of September. Time is flying. I am uh, through one of my birthdays in this weekend, my wife, she had a birthday on the third and my boy is on the 22nd. So it is um, ticking the birthdays at the end of the year so we can uh, you know, some, save some more money to, to go on holiday. But um, that is uh, just one of those things. So today we have got a, quite, a, quite an interesting uh, green room. It's uh, not, the, not the norm, but we are going to be trying to help and escort people to, um, to America via a different understanding. So we're going to try and get people through maybe an EB2 or an EB1. And we've got uh, a panelist that is, uh, doesn't need introduction. We're obviously still waiting for him to, to come and knock on the door and to, to come and join us, but um, Dr. Bruce uh, Stewart. But we, I've got Christine Fraser that is joining me today from our Cape Town office. And obviously if you guys uh, joined in last time we were on, we introduced her and uh, she is an ex-SAA pilot. So this is where she comes in. She is gonna help um, see if we can help uh, some of the pilots through a different, um, different visa to go to America. Obviously they are short of pilots in America. It just seems like they are short of everything in America. So we are gonna try and help them uh, with pilots as well. Hence, we've got Christine. So, Christine, thank you for joining me today. So, Trevor, is, I'm flying solo, not with Trevor, uh, pun intended. And um, so, we are talking about pilots today. But, uh, Christine, welcome. Thank you, Lenny. It's good to be here with you, uh, the Duke group today. Um, hopefully, we have some of my former colleagues joining us today as well. Um, I've been getting quite a few queries from them about opportunities in America. And it seems like there are some various routes that are being advertised that you could possibly get out there. So we're hoping to have a discussion with Bruce today. He's been doing this for quite some time. He's a wealth of knowledge in immigration into America. And we're going to ask him some questions and see um, you know, what, he, what his thoughts are on the different um, visa options. All right. So I see you trying to join us. He yeah. is in the attendees. I've just made him a panelist and he should be joining us. There he is. There he is. As dapper as always, look at that picture. Hello, Mr. Bruce. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> I've been watching you guys, but I couldn't join. Oh, man, it's okay, it's okay. But I'm glad <laughs> you are in now and uh, we can get this show on the road. But welcome, Bruce. Thank you for joining us again. And as I said, you don't it's really need pleasure. any introduction. But um, Good morning to you. Uh, yeah, listen, he's a... Uh, we're looking forward to chatting to you about this interesting topic and see maybe we can give people some more information and help them and guide them across uh, across the big pond. So just before we get to that, Bruce, an introduction on your side. Christine, do you want to give us a bit of a, an update on a reminder once again as well about the conference we're having this weekend in Cape Town? Yes, of course. So if uh, anybody is interested in joining our conference in Cape Town this weekend, we're holding it on Saturday. It will be at 9 a.m. at the VNA Waterfront at Workshop 17. And we'll be talking a little bit about the programs that we offer, um, our green card program. So if you're interested, please do come down, join us. And I will be leaving my email address in the chat box for anybody who wants more information. You can email me and I can send you more info. Absolutely, guys. Please come join us there. Come just uh, even if you're in the program and you want to come have a chat to us, um, give us an update on maybe where you at on your immigration process. You know, we can swap stories, swap war stories, COVID stories, and um, we can just uh, you know get to know you better. All right. So, Bruce, um, we offer a very very interesting topic. I don't know. Once again, you just want to maybe give people a, 
an update of who you are. We will touch on your book. Very, very exciting that you guys have launched your book finally. I know it's been a long time coming, and um, but we will love to do a separate webinar on that. I think it uh, uh, it needs that type of respect that we can do a separate webinar on that and we can unpack that. But if you could want to touch on that a little bit for us as well. Yeah, well, thanks very much. And um, hi, Lenny. And um, good to see you again, Christine. A um, <clears throat> little bit of background. Um, we did this move 20 years ago, came across just before 9-11 and made every single mistake in the book. I uh, trusted the wrong attorneys, got the wrong advice. Our immigration ended up taking uh, or just short of 20 years from the time we first filed an L1 petition. We went through uh, 11, 12 years of L1s and then went through H1Bs and then went through an O1 and uh, finally got uh, US citizenship um, late last year. And that's why we wrote the book Scars and Stripes, a 20-year journey through the U.S. immigration system. Um, it's humorous, it's anecdotal, but it's also quite a lot of legal stuff. The whole idea is to get people to talk about immigration and to give you some examples of how dysfunctional the system is. Um, as a disclaimer right from the beginning, um, we on at Pathway USA, we are not immigration lawyers, we are not providing legal advice, and we are not providing legal services. But over the past 20 years, we became quite intimately knowledgeable about the immigration system, its pros and cons, its advantages and disadvantages, and the numerous pitfalls. And so we set up this as an educational um, uh, consultancy. Uh, that before uh, prospective immigrants come to the U or even attempt to come to the United States, they need to get educated. I think the biggest mistake we made is we abrogated our responsibility to be informed about the visas and their qualifying requirements. And so we never picked up the mistakes that the attorneys were making. Uh, they would send us the petitions to look at before they submitted them, but we didn't know how to read these things critically. And so they were making mistakes and we paid the price. Um, so it's essential that you're educated about the visas, what their requirements are, and what the pitfalls are, so that when you're talking to an attorney, you can have an informed discussion about the road that he's going to take you. Um, and Pathway really looks at two aspects. One is to educate you about the different visas so that you can, you can choose the appropriate one. But secondly, how do you prepare for coming to the United States, building things like credit scores, looking at education, where you're going to go to live, so we really start right from the beginning of developing your immigration strategy, taking you all the way through to successfully settling um, into the US. The topic here today is what do we do about um, pilots and those specific ones, the EB1A and the EB2. So what I'm gonna be giving you is more of a workshop. If I can encourage um, our participants to think critically about themselves, um, because that's half the game, is looking at the evidence, looking at your evidence, and don't look at it through a myopic eye and think, well, I'm brilliant. Look at it from a point of view of how somebody else is going to view you, whether they think that you're brilliant. And there's a, there's a pretty big difference. Um, the cardinal rule with all um, employment-based visas is that... <sighs> The U.S. doesn't want you to come here and become a burden on the public purse. So they don't want people coming here and prospectively or possibly not finding a job and drawing unemployment. So that's one of the first aspects. The second critical aspect is that you're not allowed to come here to steal jobs for Americans. So with all of the employment-based visas, they have two essential requirements. One is that you must have a job. And some of them have a second requirement is that you must have PERM, PERM approval. And PERM is the Program Electronic Review Management. And essentially, the aspects of the PERM are that there must be a real job. Um, it can't be some sort of cookie cutter thing that's created just for you. Secondly, it's got to be offering a competitive wage. So they have to do a wage determination to see what other people in that demographic area are being paid to do that job. Thirdly, they've got to advertise that job and they've got to show that they have diligently tried to fill that position from the local workforce. And then they can file the ETA 9089, which is permission for perm approval. 
Now, some jobs, some um, visas or green cards just require a job offer. Others require a job offer plus perm approval. And that's where it becomes quite difficult because you're sitting overseas and you've got to try to find a job and go through a, um, an interview process with a prospective employer. Um, and that takes a certain amount of time. So the two exceptions to that rule of a job with or without PERM is the EB1A for people of extraordinary ability and the EB2 national interest waiver. Now, the EB1A, you can self-petition. You don't need a job. There's no PERM. You are so brilliant that the USA is just going to give you a green card because they know that you're going to have no problem in surviving in the United States. But because it's an exception to the rule of a job offer with PERM, the bar is very, very high, very high. Um, one of the attorneys that we use regularly said whenever come, somebody contacts him and even raises the question of, uh, of an EB1A, the first thing he does is he Googles them. And if they don't come up professionally on the first few pages of Google, certainly on page one, some of them, they want you on page one and page two of Google, you're not up amongst the eagles because the EB1A is for people of international acclaim. Your company might think you're brilliant. Your spouse might think you're brilliant. But does the world think you're brilliant? Does your profession think you're up in the top 1%? Because basically what you're saying to the U.S. government, there is no risk that I will become a burden on the public purse. And you're saying to the U.S. government, don't even think about a perm or, or requiring a job, job offer because there is nobody in the United States that could do this work. I'm not going to be stealing one of their jobs. Hmm. The yeah. second one is the EB-2. <clears throat> now, generally with an EB-2, the bar is slightly, ho is slightly lower. It's a, it's a second preference. Um, they're either requiring an advanced degree, which would be a master's or a doctorate, or a bachelor with at least five years of relevant experience at the time of filing the petition. So it's a fairly open and shut case. If the job says if you don't have an advanced degree or a bachelor's with um, at least five years relevant experience, don't even waste our time by applying for a job. It's a high level position. But you still need a job offer and you still need perm. The second one is maybe you don't have all the qualifications, but you are a person of extraordinary ability. In other words, you've got plenty of evidence to show that you're at the top of your field. You've been published, and I'm not talking about writing an article for your school magazine. I'm talking about where trade and industry publications are publishing the work that you're doing. They're acknowledging that you are an authority on your subject. And secondly, um, you want to be recognized. You must have received some form of industry award. And once again, uh, one of the examples that I got is somebody had received a certificate of achievement from the company in which they work that he contributed to the success of the company. That is That doesn't pass the smell test. <laughs> you know, companies dish out awards all the time to their employees. It's just part of being a nice employer but it's just certainly not the sort of accolade that the US government is looking for. One of the things that I realized very soon with, uh, with immigration is most of the time they actually don't want to approve you. I had plenty of examples with our cases where they used what they referred to as reverse legal reasoning. Right from the get-go, they decide that they're going to deny you. Then they go through your petition looking for evidence as to why they should deny you. So this is not a case of looking at the evidence and seeing where it's going. They've already made that decision. They're going to deny you. So you need to look at, first of all, the environment. And we go through various administrations as whether they are pro-immigration or anti-immigration. So the more anti-immigration they are, the more difficult it's going to be to get a visa. The legislation might not change, but basically the word comes down from high We've got too much unemployment in the United States. So the, the name of the game is deny, 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 delay, delay, delay. And we see plenty of evidence of that. So the, the two major cases on, um, on these, um, the, these uh, employment-based visa, the one is the Kazarian case. And they basically use a two-prong uh, test. And the first one is they're looking for evidence of international acclaim. 
They want to know that for an EB1A and an EB2, they want to know that there is plenty of independent, unbiased industry um, evidence. And the second part is they're going to look at it in its totality. So they're not just going to take one or two individual pieces. They're going to look at it in its totality and see whether you're making a convincing case. Now, one of my big criticism of the immigration uh, system here in this country is that quite a lot of this is subjective. You know, when they say on this Kazarian case, in its totality, are you making a convincing argument? There's no rule, there's no regulation. It's the guy who's reading it. How do you, how well have you convinced him that you are an EB1A candidate or an EB2 candidate? That's subjective. It really depends on how the guy feels that particular day. And so we've we've seen, we've witnessed countless cases where people have filed the evidence and they've got either a NOID, which is a notice of intention to deny, or they've got a massive RFE, which is a request for further evidence. Um, and we get pretty convinced, or the attorney gets pretty convinced that they're going to actually deny the case. Well, rather than proceed and get that denial, which is lethal, they just abandon the case. They repackage all of that evidence. They wait a month or two, and then they simply refile exactly what they did the last time, but they just shuffle the pages around, repackage it, and hopefully end up with a different case officer who maybe is having a better hair day today. And he looks at it and he approves it. So there is a lot of inconsistency, which we found in our cases. Um, And so reading the environment is is a pretty important one. I looked at some stats yesterday, and the current unemployment rate in the United States is currently sitting at 8.4 million people. 8.4 million. But at the same time, there are almost 11 million unfilled jobs. 11 million unfilled jobs. So we've got this thing where we've got lots of people running around without work and we've got lots of jobs sitting out there and they simply can't find people. Yeah. Well, in some sectors, they say, well, if we've got all the people sitting in the U.S., just put them in those positions. Well, sometimes you've got to match apples with apples and maybe the jobs require a level of skills or a certain type of person. And those people are not with the um, in the ranks of the unemployed. So to use the argument that you could get a national interest waiver and say, we're just going to give you a job because there are so many unfilled positions in the United States simply is incorrect. It is not a reason for getting a national interest waiver. And that remember that national interest waiver is the exception to the normal rule of having a job offer and the requirement of having a PERM certification. That is the rule. So the national interest waiver is where we're going to break the rule we're going to swim against the norm. We're not going to require that you have a job offer. And we're not even going to require perm processing. We're going to go ahead and just simply give you a green card. That is an exception. And so the, 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 the basic rule is the Darshana case, where they laid out the three-pronged approach for these national interest waivers. And I think you've been looking at them. And we've discussed, there have been countless um, uh, webinars on this. The first one is that there must be evidence that you have a proposed endeavor which has both substantial merit and of national importance. Filling a position has neither. It doesn't have substantial merit and it's not of national importance, even if there is a shortage. I know that there's a shortage of bricklayers in this country. I know that there's a shortage of, of garden service people in this. There's a shortage of waitresses in and waitrons in restaurants. That doesn't qualify for a na- national interest waiver um, with, with a job offer. So it's got to be something substantially in the safety and security of the United States. And that you are well positioned. Remember, you're coming here to continue the work that you're doing overseas so that you've got to be well positioned to come here and advance that proposed endeavor. So that's the second uh, leg of this three-part stool that um, Dana Shah asks for. And then on balance, so once again, we've got a little bit of subjectivity here. On balance, it would be beneficial to the United States to waive the job offer 
and labor certification requirement. Hmm. So the fact that you're a pilot, you might even be a great pilot. Do you meet those three tests? And that's where the issue is. Then what I did is I looked through and I started looking for some cases. <clears throat> um, <coughs> excuse me. We've been, we've been processing and, and talking to, to pilots for years about uh, these Generally, and really, we sort of step into a, a, um, a sort of a gatekeeper process with the attorneys that um, that we like working with. Um, when I meet with prospective clients, I ask them to tell me how brilliant they are. But I'm sort of putting a USCIS type hat, hat on me, and I don't believe them. So I try to get them to convince me first that they are brilliant, that the work that they're doing is phenomenally important. Um, and yeah, as far as a pilot is concerned, I'm not a pilot. I don't know squat about um, the, the airline industry. So, But then neither do the USCIS guys know anything about the airline industry. So I work on the basis that if you can convince me that you are brilliant, then I'll refer you to an attorney. If you can't convince me, that you're amongst the eagles and that you're in the top one or two percent of your industry worldwide. Well, then we've got to sit down, we've got to figure out what can you do. And I've been pretty successful in terms of if you can convince me and I pass you on to an attorney, they generally are going to agree with me. Now, that's not that I'm any good at this. Um, it's just that before you go and see yeah, an attorney, works. I want you to persuade me that you're that good. Mm. And I looked at some of the articles, and here was here a couple where and there, there are far more of these things that are denied on the NIW than are approved. But here was one. He was a helicopter pilot and an instructor who specialized in recurrent emergency training and mountain flying. So just, yeah, he was a helicopter pilot, but he had an area of specialization and he was not only a pilot, but he was an instructor as well. National interest waiver was approved. Then there was a flight test engineer and instructor who performed the evaluation of the first flight management system integrated into a single pilot cockpit of a fighter attack aircraft as well as the largest software change to the FA-18 operational flight program. Sounds simple. There was another one that was approved. Then there was a pilot who specialized in medical evacuation and emergency flying. He got an NIW. Wow. A pilot and aerospace engineer who specialized in the field of test flight education. Now, if you look at those examples, just as <clears throat> four examples of something out of the ordinary, now look at your own situation. What have you been doing that is more than just flying an aircraft? I had a debate with somebody recently as whether um, even somebody like Sally Salenberger if he was a pilot overseas and he was applying for an NIW or an EB1A, would he get it or would he not get it? Yeah. Well, he's, he, can emerge, he can land emergency. <laughs> well, there was, yeah, yeah. there was, but, you know, the silly part of that is he should have chosen summer, not the middle of winter. <laughs> so that was a failure in judgment as well. But looking at that, there was one incident. But if one, and that's not an endeavor that is of sustained national interest merit. So he's not going to continue doing that sort of thing in the United States. Yeah. So really, as a, as a non-pilot, as a non-lawyer, I don't believe that that would qualify for either an NIW or a, um, an EB1A. Hmm. Sure. Okay, yeah, so Bruce, you know, to be, um, I'm, yeah. Actually, what I what I'm actually wanted to say is that that's a little bit little bit encouraging for me because we do have a lot of really qualified pilots, highly qualified, 
um, a lot of pilots from the Air Force, a lot of pilots that have been involved in test flying and in all sorts of different programs, there's too many to actually mention, that I think they, um, just based um, on what you've shared with me now, shared with us, is that they might actually stand the chance of, of being approved on this, on the NRW visa. And, um, you know, I think the right thing would probably be for them to contact you and convince you of such a thing. Um, and and then you possibly you have a look at their situation and scenario and, and let them know, you know, give them some indication as to whether or not this could be an opportunity for them. Christine, exactly. The, the, the biggest challenge that I've come across um, with South Africans, and I'm sort of guessing that a large percentage of, of the participants here today are from South Africa, is, is we tend to be um, quite self-deprecating about how brilliant we are. You know, to use an Afrikaans <laughs> phrase, South Africans are not particularly went hot. And so they, that ev the evidence of the great things that have been done sort of gets buried as part of the normality. Um, mm. I knew uh, many years ago, I knew a, a South African Airways pilot. He was a uh, fleet captain for one of the fleets. And uh, we were sitting in a pub one night and somebody asked him what he did. And he said he was a bus driver. Um, <laughs> he didn't want to get onto the thing that, you know, not only am I a pilot, but I'm actually a fleet captain. He just said, I'm a bus driver. And so a lot of the, the evidence yeah, is yeah. there, but it needs to be packaged. Yeah. And if if anything comes out of out of this webinar, it's is for pilots to think about what have they done throughout their careers, which are worth bragging about. Dig up that stuff and find the evidence, because that is what this is all about. It is not only the evidence, but how the evidence is presented. Um, okay. It's the wordage that is being used. And that's what one needs to start doing now. And as you say, yes, there are South African pilots who have got incredibly um, interesting track records. But who knows about it and how they're going to present that to somebody who is not a pilot um, and who probably is a little bit biased towards granting you that national interest waiver yeah. and to start that preparation of work now. All right. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, there's a lot of pilots that would, would, would going to probably listen to this and um, in anticipation that there is maybe a route for them to the United States. So if this is maybe not successful for them on an EB2 or an EB1A, are there any other options for them? And I'm going to follow up with another question. It's like, what advice would you give pilots looking to relocate to the United States with the hope of continuing their flying career? Okay. Unless you've got a, a criminal record, there is pretty much a visa or a green card available for anybody who wants to come to the um, USA. Mm -hmm. We can fit you into something. And that's why we run these, it's a two hour workshop that we run. We get a questionnaire from uh, somebody who's interested in looking at the US. Um, I go through it, and based on the questionnaire, there's some visas that automatically stand out. There are others which don't stand out. Um, and then we have this, this Zoom workshop where I go into your family, your finances, your qualifications, your skills, and plot out a way of getting into the United States with visas, looking at each of the visas, what their pros and cons are, what their disadvantages are, what their qualifying requirements are. In some instances, yes, you meet all of, you check all of the boxes on the qualifying requirements. In some, you don't, but it's an easy fix to do something which could check another one of those boxes. Mm -hmm. um, and then sort of narrow it down as to what the best, the best options are. But very infrequently will I come to somebody and say, listen, there is absolutely no way that you're gonna get to the US. Uh, invariably, there's going to be an option, either for you or your spouse, that one of you can get a visa to come into the United States. Um, if it's a green card option, well, then obviously only one of you needs to qualify. And, you know, I'm thinking specifically about um, some of your guys, Lenny uh, and Christine. Um, you know, one of the spouses comes and does a job with you. The other spouse automatically has a green card. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what so, you know. 
Find with, with a pilot, them. that is an option as well. You know, if the pilot is having a difficulty getting a, a job with an airline in the USA and, uh, you know, you could talk to some of your existing clients, but that FAA license is um, absolutely essential to um, to getting a, um, uh, a good job in the United States. Um, but if the pilot is having some difficulty, well, maybe the spouse uh, will do one of the job offerings that you guys have got, because that yeah. gives both of them a, a green card. And then the uh, pilot can go ahead and apply for a job. And when they say to him, do you have work authorization? It's not a case of, well, I will get one in a couple of years time if you offer me the job. You can say, of course, I have, I have a green card. So there is a road to the United States for anybody who wants to do it. There are just various factors which could lead you in one way. Because, for example, um, your kids, pilots who have children, if they're in their teens, um, a non-immigrant visa is a bad, bad choice because non-immigrant visas will take a long time before you get a green card. That kid's probably going to age out at, uh, before you get the green card because children lose their derivative status at the age of 21. So if they've got older kids, um, I don't even suggest that they look at doing a non-immigrant visa. They have to go straight for the immigrant visa, the green card. Yeah. If they've got small children and they're prepared to spend a little bit of time going through this, um, absolutely put them into a, a non-immigrant visa. And um, a year or two after they get here, they can have this epiphany and say, well, America is a whole lot nicer than I thought it was going to be. I've changed my mind and I would actually like to stay here. So the critical part is to plan that long-term thing of not only how you're going to get into the United States, but how you're going to stay here permanently if that is your ultimate intention. Mm -hmm. And uh, secondly, how are you going to be happy when you get here? Are you living in the right part of the U.S.? You know, it's 50 different countries. Yeah, Life in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I am, is very different to life in Louisiana or life in Texas or life in California. Uh, you got to decide where you want to be. Uh, then decide what schooling you're going to use for your children, what industry you're in. Say if you're a pilot, for example, it does narrow your options because ideally you want to be fairly close to a, um, a major hub. So there's a lot of investigation that goes into your move before you actually make it. Um, one of the most critical ones that we found is if you don't have a credit score when you get to the United States, life is difficult and life is very expensive. And to build that credit score before you even get here is absolutely essential. It makes life so much easier. Yeah. So these yeah. are all of the things that I cover in, in those, uh, those workshops. Um, <clears throat> you know, with, 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 our, with our case, we made mistakes. The attorneys made mistakes. But ultimately, we ended up paying the bills. As I say, our immigration took 20 years and our costs were something in the order of 450,000 US dollars. That's what our immigration, I jokingly sometimes say it would have been a lot cheaper if I just flown to South America and got a coyote to bring me across in a limo. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you could have gotten a free, a free uh, bus, bus trip to, to New York. Ab ab absolutely, absolutely. And so, you know, I use, I use the phrase, uh, going to, an, uh, to just picking an attorney out of the hat. You know, they're nice guys, but there are good attorneys and there are bad attorneys. And they're like doctors. They don't specialize in every single type of visa. So it's trying to find an attorney who specializes in the particular visa that you have chosen, that you sort of feel that you would qualify for. Because remember, you will pay those fees, win or lose. Yeah. So this is not like, like, there's no fiduciary responsibility here where the attorney only get paid if you win. The attorneys get paid regardless. And so it's absolutely essential that that is a meeting of two professional minds, that he knows the law, but you need to be pretty educated so that you can make certain that he doesn't make a mistake. And mistakes are regular. Remember, you're only focusing on one case, yours. That attorney's probably got 50, 100, 200, 500 cases that he's thinking about. It yeah. is very easy for him to file your case, forget about it for the next year, and then an RFE comes in asking for a whole lot of technical questions, and he's got to try to remember your case of a year ago, and so they make mistakes. That's where your responsibility is. 
So watch out when, when somebody glibly right. says, oh, we can get you a national interest waiver. Be careful. That's all I can say on that one. You wanted to say that? Christine, yeah, you Bruce, um, just something. a question. Yes, yeah. thank you. On the national interest waiver, um, should a pilot um, qualify for it? So you have their credentials you, and you think that they've got a good chance. Um, so you, Christine, how, you, Christine, you broke up terribly there. Your, your Wi-Fi is a bit... Sorry about that. Okay, let me try, let me try again. Yeah, okay. okay, so if if a pilot was um, successful in the, well, you thought that they had a good case for the national interest waiver, how long do you anticipate that process to take? Because a lot of the pilots now are have lost their jobs and um, are, are in, you know, they, they want to take up employment as soon as possible. So they might take up the option of a temporary um, a temporary residence if they, like you said, if they have small children and then look to the green card permanent resident um just speaking to the time frame um what do you what do you suggest or what do you um what in your experience for the temporary visa versus waiting for a permanent visa hmm. um you know some of the non-immigrant visas can be very very quick um after I moved to Ireland because of our immigration system, I applied for the O-1 visa, um, colloquially known as the Genius Visa. It's it's the uh, non-immigrant version of the uh, of the EB-2. You require an advanced degree. You must be published, and you must have peer reviews and peer recognition. I filed uh, that petition and my petition with Premium Processing which is basically an extra $1,250 or $1,500 that you add onto the fee. And it's basically a palm greaser to get your case moved to the top of the heap as opposed to the bottom of the heap. And my O-1 was approved in 15 days. That's how fast it, wow. it, it goes. Um, my daughter, after finishing um, her master's degree with a, quite a stellar track record of what she'd done in the theater industry, she filed for an O-1 and hers was approved in seven days. So some of these can be very, very quick. Your L-1s can be filed with, your intracompany transfers can be filed with premium processing. So they get you in here very, very quickly if they're allowing. And at times the, the USCIS um, puts a cap on the premium processing. They're saying, we're so overloaded at the moment. Um, we're not accepting premium processing for that particular visa. Essentially what premium processing is, is you pay that money, put you at the top of the heap, and they've got to give you an answer within 15 days. So you're basically pushing them to give you the answer. Well, if they can't give you an answer within 15 days, either they just deny you or they send you an RFE, a request for further evidence. And that stops the clock. And then they will say, well, we'll give you 30 days or 60 days or six months to respond to an RFE. And until you respond, the clock is paused. But the moment you respond, the clock starts running with another 15 days. So sometimes they are so overloaded that they will actually stop premium processing. But if premium processing is permissible with that particular visa that you're going for, you can get a visa very quickly. Now, normally you would come in on a non-immigrant visa, and if it is dual intent and it allows you to change your mind and develop immigrant intent, um, then you've got to file a thing called an I-140, which is a petition to change your status from non-immigrant status to immigrant status. That's usually where any weaknesses in your initial petition are going to show up. And so you could get denied on that. But if that is approved, then you can go ahead and you can file your petition for a green card. So you're sort of spreading out the process over a number of years. What you're doing on an immigrant petition where you're going straight to green card is you don't even leave South Africa until you actually have the green card in your passport. So they file the visa component with the permanent residence component altogether. And your case first goes to the USCIS that looks at the visa component to see whether you meet the requirements of the visa. And if they approve that, then they send it to the Department of State that is now going to look at the green card component. So it's a, it's a two-part exercise. Mm -hmm. And generally, those things take um, about two years to process.
Yeah. Um, maybe a little bit less if there isn't a um, labor certification or perm that is required because that the perm is generally a six month process. So it could be 18 months before you get a, uh, a decision on your green card. But there are only a limited number of green cards that they allocate in each of these um, preferences each year. So you've got to have a look at what your priority date is, and you've got to have a look at how many green cards are still available. And that is published each year or each month in the visa bulletin. The attorneys have all of these. Um, I periodically go and have a look at them, but basically they're telling you how fast or how slow they are with individual countries and with individual um, green cards. So, for example, um, if you are born in India, their priority date is not current. So they, even though they might approve you, it's going to be a period of time before you actually get the visa allocated to you. Because remember, there are only 40,000 of these visas, of these, of these green cards, allocated each year. And they are split up amongst countries. So once a country has taken its allocation, there are no more green cards for that particular country for that particular year. So they will go on to a waiting list. I know that India has uh, quite a long waiting list. China has quite a lot of waiting list. Um, South Africa generally, no, that's, you're always pretty much priority. But you're probably not going to get your green card within about 18 months to two years. Yeah. But how long it is, it's like saying, how long is a piece of string? Yeah. Of course. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you, Bruce. <clears throat> yeah, I really appreciate the information. I mean, you've got a wealth of knowledge to sh share with us that you have been sharing with us. And I th think it's really been invaluable for my ex-colleagues and the pilots in South Africa. I think they've really, really appreciated it because there has been a lot of information and a lot of articles floating around and you're not sure. It just sounds too good to be true kind of information. So we appreciate your advice. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Christine, I've listened to a, a couple of the, the webinars. Um, I walked away from a lot of these where they're talking about the NIW a lot of these women are sort of thinking that, yeah, it's too good to be true. It sounds very easy. Um, it's a little bit like asking a fox to design the safety, the security of a chicken coop. Hmm. The attorneys want the work. And uh, yeah, what happens if they file this and the NIW is denied? Then you go straight back to having to find a job and having to uh, go and, well, you might as well do that right from the get-go. Yeah. And I, th I don't think the attorneys are doing anything that is, certainly it's not unlawful. I just think that they need to tell you what the downsides are so that you can make an informed decision. Mm. But when you're selling a product, do you actually want to tell somebody about what the risks are in the product that you're selling them? No, I don't think you do. And that's really the, the, the point of departure that we set out when we started Pathway uh, I don't know, eight, 10 years ago is I charge for the time when I'm doing those workshops. Whether you, whether you go with Induku, whether you go with a particular attorney, what visa you choose, is immaterial to me. I don't have a vested interest in that. So if I think that you've got a lousy case, I'm going to tell you that you've got a lousy case. Rather know that up front. You know, if my attorney had told me up front that my L1 was a bad case, that yes, I would get an L1, probably get lots of or renewals, but that the chances of getting that approved on the I-140 were about zero, then at least mentally I would have thought, okay, I'm coming to the United States, but I know that there's a clock and that sooner or later I'm going to have to leave the country and go back to South Africa. But I didn't know about an L1. Yeah. I didn't know that there was another bar that I had to, another hoop that I had to jump through in order to apply for green card. So it was ignorance on my part. And when that I-140 was denied and denied, and then my wife had an I-140 and that one was denied as well. And I thought, but hang on a second, guys. We've been here for 12 years. How can you now deny us permanent residence? Yeah. So the attorney no, should have told me right up front that you, you, get an, you get an L, but you are at risk of not getting the O, the I-140. 
Yeah, that's why we, we do this, Bruce. I mean, we, uh, a lot of people that are maybe in limbo of deciding maybe if our program is for them or not for them. And these are generally people that have done, not done a lot of research. And this is what I'm going to suggest for the pilots listening here. Obviously, that is a, an avenue they might want to, to consider as going to the States, but they haven't done any research on this. And just by being um, either anxious or just being, you know, just want to jump into anything that's going to, that looks like a good thing, um, we, we refer people to you guys. And, and I know you guys will give them the, the straight and, and, and forward. And most times they, they come back to us uh, and they just file for the EB3. Which is uh, which is what we do, and we've got we've got quite a lot of positions in that. So, you know, I would say, Bruce, that um, for give a, give the guys some of your details. I mean, we will obviously uh, put it on our site as well and um, on this webinar. But I think it's best for for people that are wanting to explore this a little bit more and ask the real questions and get the straight answers. Is chat to you, go through that two hour session with you, and rather get informed when you know it doesn't it's not going to sound like the things that you want to hear and i think that is what people find immigration is maybe harsh is that but don't understand immigration don't tell me it's going to be hard because i i've just been given a job offer all it, all they told me is get myself that side and we get that all the time it's not that simple you yeah know, we we need to tell you the the harshness of us and an attorney is like you said is nine out of 10 times going to tell you uh, the, the shortcut to it, but not the longer term implications of your case. I mean, you're going to be mm -hmm. there for a year and you're going to have to come back. And, and same on our side, when we started in Duku, is because we wanted to help people immigrate successfully. And immigrate successfully, unfortunately, you've got to have a green card. You don't want to be somewhere on a temporary basis if it's not going to look good for the future. And, um, and this is why we, we're glad to, to have partnered with the, the likes of you. I see one question has come through. Oh, it's just Diane. So Diane's just uh, posted the, the link for, uh, for you guys. And uh, we will comp copy that link as well. And it was forwarded to all the pilots that uh, are listening to this. So uh, guys, I think we have been run out of time. I mean, it's been a lot of information and it's been quick. And Bruce, I think your mouth is dry. I think you do speak a lot as well, but you, you are speaking fit. <laughs> but uh, it's been great to have you on the, on the webinar in the green room again. Um, we obviously will unpack your, your book as well in the, in the near future. We'd uh, love for people to, to buy that. I think where can they, where can they get a copy of the book? Um, we've, we've got a, a website open for the book. Um, perhaps if Dai's on, still on here, I can give you the link. Um, it's scarsandstripesbook.com. Ah, um, awesome. We took a play on stars and stripes, the American flag, and it's scars and stripes, and and is spelled out A-N-D, scarsandstripesbook.com. It's currently available in, um, in Kindle, and... Um, the first hard copy versions arrived yesterday. Um, I'm busy looking at uh, uh, shipping options for outside the United States. Unfortunately, shipping tends to be uh, quite an expensive exercise. But if, uh, if people outside the USA are interested in uh, reading the book, um, it's certainly not a, a tiny paperback. You know, it's a it's a three. It's almost a three hundred page book, and uh, so it's got loads and loads and loads of information in it. Um, but if I can ship the thing internationally at a reasonable price, um, it will be available as well. But right now, it is available um, on Kindle. Absolutely awesome! But uh, once again, congratulations on the book, and uh, mm. I will get my copy for sure. And um, and we will chat again. Any last things from you, Christine? Me, no, that's just um, thank you to Bruce and uh, thank you to yourself as well for um, having this green room for the pilots. I'm sure uh, I certainly do appreciate it. So thank you very much. Mm. Awesome. Christine, you had a lot of questions that you sort of uh, sent through to me yesterday. Did I cover all of those to, um, to your satisfaction? Because as a pilot, um, you've got a sort of a, an inside track on the sort of issues facing pilots. Yes, Bruce, I think very much so. Thank you. Um, I actually had them, yeah, I was going to ask.
ask you through the session, but I didn't really need to. You addressed them all, so I really appreciate it. Thank you. Fantastic. Oh, it, enjoyable, and um, I hope that uh, your participants uh, found this of, uh, of interest. But remember, I'm not a, a lawyer. I'm not giving legal advice. Um, ultimately, they need to go and find an attorney, but at least if they can have an informed discussion uh, with an attorney, um, that makes life a whole lot easier. Yeah, mm. I agree. Absolutely. Guys, Absolutely. thank you very much. Have a great week further, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Super. Thank you all. Bye-bye.